Okay, I think I'm in ready to go mode. Hope the audio is okay. I am uh, genuinely delighted to be here. I've known about the Institute for many years, didn't have an opportunity to get here, and now I have an opportunity on hundreds of faces who are going to smile, right? At least occasionally. So let me draw a little bit of attention to um, my having inserted the word engineering in front of design thinking. It's been my experience over the last 15 months, largely on sabbatical in Europe, that the word design alone uh, is confusing to people. I inserted the word re relevance because I think it's an open question. Is engineering design thinking relevant to service science? and especially service science design. I hope so. I will share some of the future, some of the present, and some of the past with you to try to create a good hunting experience. In my world of design, everything is context dependent. Unlike physics, chemistry, math, that are universals, in design, everything context dependent, and therefore everything I wish to share with you today is dependent on the sky. Who is it? A short biographical sketch, if you'll allow me. This little guy on the left came off the beaches of Southern California as a surfer guy. And he built his own surfboards, and therefore I thought it maybe he should be an engineer and he earned an engineering degree, and that was good. And then he went to Italy for six months, and he decided he should be an artist. So he earned his master's degree in art, and then the art program was very human-centered, but he didn't know what humans were, so he decided to do a neuroscience PhD. And that was a moment in life when I could stand tall, big degree over my shoulder, ooh. Of course, flying private planes, assistant professorship. I created our verdict, and they fired me. Because they wanted an engineering scientist, and they got an engineering designer. And it was the best thing that ever happened to me, because then I got back to Stanford, which was looking for a designer. And I survived the whole tenure game, and this is the posture my wife says I live in. You have to respect my wife's opinion because she's Swiss German. That's my evolution, and it's ongoing. This is the trailer for a conference on engineering design, ICE conference series. Uh, we hosted that meeting in 2009. And that's what we did as a team. That's a bad button. Better button. Many times the slides go up, they're just for you to read. I won't be talking to them. I can assure you that I was kind of shocked by that question. So for most of the world, you say design and people see an artist. In my world, you say design, you see an engineer. Today, when you say design, we see a service science guy. We've all designed. Service design guy. And that's been our evolution over the last 50 years. Each of the horizontal bars is spinning off the design thinking philosophy, the strategies, the value system into different application domains. And then some of them are obvious, like mechatronic systems and manufacturing and nanotechnology and learning design. Some of the big recent deals. IDO is a recent phenomenon in our history pattern, the design consultancy. 
And now we're moving design labs out into the world well beyond our own campus and beyond Europe. This is context on the school I live and work in. I suggest you not read the fine print, just try to cope with the notion that over the last 30, 40 years, 11,000 companies, really? That was a shock for me to read. This was perhaps even more shocking. I've never stopped as an academician to count what our turnover effect on the planet is. Okay. Interesting. We're strongly attached to our alumni. We have good representation from Germany. And actually, if you take the top three, very strong representation from the Germanic cultures. The hottest thing in our community is mechatronics, blending electronics, mechanics, software, and user interface to produce all these widgets we have in our world. That being one of them. Yeah. Even so, the software guys dominate. They rule everything. And all of the design challenges we get today demand software at the internet and connectedness level. But the real point here was to say it had a huge impact on education on our campus because three computer science faculty last spring gave a course with an enrollment of 355,000 students from over a hundred countries, and it was all free. And they're having a huge impact on how education might go forward. One of the other big impacts is our eSchool co-founder, Professor David Kelly, who is one of the co-founders of Ideal Product Development. And what he likes to do most is give workshops to executives. No, it's just the scene from that environment. The hunting metaphor is one that I'm increasingly fond of to give a context for how we go looking for big ideas. I always like to ask an audience, if you've had the experience of hunting for a wild animal, killing it taking it home, eating it. See, there's barely a hand, maybe one. And I take this as a measure of our cultural loss of the talent, the instincts, the behaviors for hunting. We kind of think hunting is going to the local Ethica store. Aisle five, section three, get what we want. It's not that way for big idea hunting. I don't know the origins, I don't know the author, but my doctoral student from Munich shared this image with me, and it was a perfect way to say, this is not what I mean by hunter. This is the mission of my education program as I'm involved in it and the research program associated with it. I see all products as services. For me, there isn't a sharp distinction. The focus of our research has been on those hunters. What makes for a good hunter? What makes for a good hunting team? It's only through better hunters that we're going to eat more big ideas.
Over the last couple of years, we've begun to be uh, more confident about our ability to manage the product and service innovation challenges, the hunting part, but we are now discovering that that was the easy part. And taking these big new ideas back into large organizations, corporate, academic, or government, is really hard. Be louder. Adjustment in place. Try again. Sound level is okay. I can get louder. Okay. So we have some hard, fast rules in this game, and that's one. This should never go alone. In ancient times, that was well understood, because the woods and the rainforest have dangerous beasts, and if you're alone, you're in trouble. What isn't always clear in the world of science and engineering communities is that it's all about people. It's not so much that bow and arrow or that rifle. It's about the people you're going with. And the key to working with people is communication. And we are of the opinion that any time you communicate tangibly, you trump any other mode of communication. We certainly have it in English, and I'm led to believe it's in the German language as well. Somebody would say, can you make that comment more tangible? We're not big on brainstorming. Why would you want to go into a little box that's closed, you can't see, can't move, and storm in there when you could connect that brain to a body and really see and really hear and really pound the table, do things with the mind and body. So we storm by building things. And we build things to accelerate the rate of learning. And we have solid research results, I'll share later, that show that the rate of learning of a team defines the probability of their making a breakthrough. I'll give an example in a few minutes of how important it is for management and faculty to let their people do crazy things. No idea what they're up to. But it's my job to let them. Yeah, don't break your neck. A curious thing about this activity called design is that it is about creating ambiguity. Every time we come up with a new idea for how the future could be, we've reduced the probability of knowing what that future will be. So we literally create ambiguity. And my argument will be, embrace ambiguity. It's good stuff. So we see our educational goal as one of creating T people. And this is a simplification, but it works in a short audience conversation. And the issue is not whether you should be one or the other, but which one should you be in the moment. The I person is, tends to be defined by their body of knowledge, their expertise, their skills. It's what most of higher education is about. We build that part. Much of our design education is committed to building the horizontal part. What are we going to do with what we know? It's one thing to have a stack of facts, and something entirely different to use those facts innovatively, entrepreneurially, to create the new. 
on the back to the first law, we need a team of these people, not solos. Seems straightforward, yeah? Not straightforward. Why is it so hard? Why every year do I get feedback from my class about how hard it is? They don't even have exams, and yet they claim that it's hard. And here's one way to interpret that. It was developed by one of our doctoral students, Michael Lande, and after some years of convincing, he said, okay, Larry, it's because you start mostly with engineers, and then you require that they behave like designers. And then you take the designer and require that they behave like foresight strategic planners. And then you take the strategic planner and you force them to behave like manufacturing people. Now that's a lot of very different professions. And yet we're demanding that the team do all four. That's that bad button again. So we have a group of challenges we give to each team, to each class. We now call them mission statements. You start in that upper corner green and you're supposed to end up in the yellow with a pre-production prototype. And Micah studied how different teams performed over the years. And this is an example of one team that notably doesn't get into two quadrants spends most of its time in the design quadrant with just a little engineering time. And this is another team. And it gets into all the quadrants. And it moves back and forth across the quadrant. So it visits, changes, visits again. And the difference between them is these guys produce the wow. And the other guys receive the thank you. Big difference if you're looking for breakthrough innovation. Some examples from what goes on in the practice we do in the lab. We are always working with two teams, one at Stanford with three to four people on it at the master's level, one somewhere else in the world, in this case, the examples from Munich about several years ago. And the little button on the bottom says, when kit. Okay. That's my mission, to get that lined up this day. So each of these teams has a teaching team with it. The teaching team requires two to three instructors, faculty from different disciplines. And then each team gets a professional coach He's probably gone through the curriculum, probably working in the region, and helps them network. And this is the year we discovered that, be damned, these guys in Munich are not the same as the guys in California. And it's not just the guys or the gals or, that are different as individuals, but they're surrounded by culture that's different. And that makes an impact on performance. So they got culture coaches. And then the big dog in all of this is the corporate sponsor who brings a design challenge to us and an honorable amount of money so that we can have the teams travel to visit each other and build real stuff and test it and break it and build new real stuff. We get our people from all over the planet, and the very first thing we have to do is start showing them how to perform on technical design teams. And this is one of our favorite things to do, build a paper bike.
a little more on context. Uh, this is the community I live within. We've got lots of corporations around us. Uh, we tend to be uh, a little overly proud that we created many of them. But each of you, every community has a surround, has talent, has special properties. That's why we go international. This is, uh, at a glance, the distribution into 10 to 11, nine projects at our campus, and 20 elsewhere in the network. So about a dozen universities doing this now. And again, an invitation to engage Kit in that metric. I'd like to point out this is actually pretty complicated work. The student is on a team, take number three. And then there are two teams. And then there are two coaches. And then there are two bosses. There's a boss on the left that'll give them a grade. This is an absolute core course in their degree program. And there's a boss on the right who will say, I like that product, thanks. Or I, look, I like that product, wow, give me one. That's the organization chart. No command control. We have to do all of this out of the intent, the will, and the commitment to collaborate. Multiple universities, multiple companies. I can't overemphasize how important the physical space is to what will happen in that space. It's actually the technology that enables creative breakthrough behavior. Everyone can see everyone. The middle of the room is a stand up, talk, collaborate, drink beer on Thursdays. The video conference to connect to all of our international partner is in the center of the design space. The guitars. We like to keep stuff in there. It's not clean and orderly. This round wheel is one of the most extraordinary paper bikes we've seen in recent times. It's to be propelled by the driver in the white object pitching forward, causing the wheel to go forward. It was elegantly designed, stuffed in six different suitcases, shipped to Palo Alto, assembled in 24 hours, rolled out to the race, and it failed. Immediately. And we love it for the courage of their attempt and to celebrate the failure on what we learned from it. Included in the design space is the fabrication space. So we don't have design one place, fab and manufacturing somewhere else. They have to be very close. They actually have to be within seven seconds of each other. Got an idea? Seven seconds to the shop. I've already pitched the importance of space. This is a book that came out in the last year by the people in the D school who've been designing and redesigning the D space every year for the last eight years. A lot of collected wisdom there. This is a seminal image from the day that Hasso Plotner, I guess you all have some idea that he's the co-founder of SAP, and he re read this article about IDEO design development, and he walked into his Sapphire Corporate Congress, and he waved the magazine, and he said, we are going to become a user-centered company. Some of you probably use SAP software, and you're waiting for that day to arrive. We're working on it.
So we are tending to believe that this set of values and strategies and methods can be applied to the design of most anything. It's in our history, and it's what we see possible in the world, and we are in the process of trying to measure the truth in that statement versus the belief in that statement. The curriculum I'm going to share with you uh, further right now takes 30 weeks. The first 10 weeks are all about exploring the problem space. The next 10 weeks are all about exploring the solution space. And only the last 10 weeks are devoted to solving. And that's in stark contrast to most engineering scenarios where you get a problem and you go to work. And we have found it beneficial to literally allocate two-thirds of all available time to better understanding the problem, broadly exploring the solution space, and then delivering. An example. How many people you do convertibles? That's a smaller number than I would expect with all the BMW, Audi, EAW. You guys are the car capital of the universe, and you're not using their convertibles because they don't deliver a great experience. They mostly deliver bad wind. And the challenge was fix it. One of the strong preferences we have as an education point of view is figure out what's critical. What absolutely has to get done right or all the rest doesn't matter. And here's, we asked them to do that in the first week they're on the project. And these are the guys in Munich who are part of a big automotive research center and they're going to compute their way to the truth. Okay. That's critical. The blue areas there are wind that recirculates from behind, that you're at the back of the head at essentially the same velocity as your forward movement. Bad wind. Those flow simulations don't tell you anything about acoustics. So this team didn't have the comps. So it got the stethoscope and a bent copper tube and it went looking for the sound. Where's all that bad sound coming from? And we did many prototypes. It put the standard tufts on the car, drove it around. That was interesting. The two came home and parked and all the tufts hung down. So then, it, of course, you do the next thing. You dribble paint all over your new BMW and you go for that ride. And then when you come home, the paint is all dribbled across your car and you can see what the flow patterns were. That's Interesting. And then you decide that, well, you're not really seeing the three-dimensional flow, you're only seeing the surface flow, and most computational dynamics stays close to the surface. <clears throat> they actually, the silver tubes, they have an idea for a solution. Two leaf blowers, you know leaf blowers? We'll put in two leaf blowers and blow the bad wind back out. Didn't work. Now they're collecting more data, and now they're emboldened. They're well past the halfway mark in this design cycle. They need to have a solution. They've now built at considerable expense and time a bent aluminum channel. They've welded it to the car windshield frame. This is going to be the solution. Maybe some of you can guess that the solution would appear to take the 130 kilometer per hour wind. It was going over and back and instead delivered to your lap. Big failure. Second rule, never give up. In the real world of hunting, it was not okay to come home without the dinner. Here the dinner is the big idea. 
You've got to stay out there till you find it. One of the ways we like to provoke people into doing that is the dark horse. A dark horse in American horse racing is the filly, the horse, that's unknown and unlikely to produce a win. But if they do, and you're a betting person, they're going to win big time. So we ask all of our people to, now that you've hit the wall, do something radically different. And their radical different was abandon the car and build a water trough and put a model car in it and inject dye to look at the flow and put prototype solutions into that flow every 20 minutes. With a real car, it took days to a week to test one idea. Now they can do it every half hour. And in this moment, this image captures that the flow pattern that's most troublesome is right there at the angle of the hood to the windshield in the middle of the car. And they're now 20 out of 30 weeks into this. They do not have a solution. And all of this testing failed to yield a a solution. So it's a little hard in this environment to convey the sense that I'm one of the designers and I have a power drill. And I'm so angry that I'm going to cut a hole right to the windshield, right in that bad place. Not because I think there's a solution there, I just want to kill the bad wind. Unbelievable. It worked. On inspection, the ink injected in that location now flows straight through the cockpit, same 130 kilometers an hour, but straight through the cockpit, no backflow. Dear Professor Leifert, can we cut a hole in a window? No way, you can't do that, it's going to shatter. Tell me how it goes. So they cut a hole much bigger than actually needed. It didn't shatter. I was wrong. They shrank it down to that little black tube, since an irrigation pipe, and they eliminate the problem. Eliminate, not solve, eliminate. Now that you've got this big solution, you have to deliver. Not enough just to say you got the game, you have to bring the game home. They had only like three to four weeks left, and they built a high-performance mechatronic trap door. It had sensors so that birds and leaves and rain don't come through. It has another sensor so that if this is going between uh, we're in the cockpit, I'm driving, you're a passenger, and there's a jet stream coming through. So what happens if Larry reaches over to get something? It's something called glasses in the jet stream. I lost one pair. So they put a sensor on the inside of the cockpit. They put the trap door back up on the inside of the cockpit, and it closes if I reach. The computation guys have been working with all along, and it's a close collaboration, and now it's back to computation, and the green arrow says, hey, that's going to work. The yeah, it's going to flow through. There's no reflux. Fantastic. Of course, we knew that. We've been driving the car. <clears throat> and now you have the test results. The arrows are about wind. Orange wind is bad. Green wind is good. Convertible, you want some wind in your face. But not a lot. Okay, so that's the technical result. But you really should be looking at the blue circle, the lady in the circle. So this was all about delivering a good experience. A young lady in pain, her own hair whipping her, and a smiling partner for the drive. So the 
for me, it's just a wonderful, iconic example. You do all of your engineering, why? To prove you're an engineer or to give somebody a good experience? I'm for the latter. It's seven years later, patented in 103 countries, last I heard, not on the road. Because you know better than I do that BMW is not going to put a car on the road with a hole in the windshield. <laughs> We're waiting to see. Another example, quite different, but focused entirely on experience. And it's back to my Swiss contract, yeah? A designer. I think you know that gesture better than I do. And the key is that this remote person is going to become tangible, on the table with me, gesturing. Swisscom may never do that, but it's become a hot research project in our lab and may get that into the last part of the presentation. Does this look like a challenge for engineer? Well, we do have motivation. That's one hell of a market. And grow it. What's the user experience? Target user demographic is young women between 15 and 25 a stage when they're typically choosing to use makeup, not use makeup, what kind of makeup. So it's a critical, ado critical adoption stage. Whoops. Yeah. Okay, I hope you've seen the two, eyeshadow and the liner. And then, a little hard to see, I think, but uh, yeah, I've messed up the shadow. If you get that line in the wrong place, you can't go out on the street that way. You have to take all the makeup off, start over, meantime to repair, 20 to 30 minutes, and you're on the way to the office. You're a career lady, and you can't be messing around 30 minutes of redesign. I'm absolutely loving this image, you know, it's just an impossible image, and yet it kind of gets to the core of it. The engineers are going to start measuring stuff and replicating stuff and testing stuff. Putting on your eye makeup used to take time, lots of time. Adding color, blending color, and then taking away color to try to make your eyes match. Highliner's tricky. Too often, your hand slips as you line your eye, so you have to erase and start again. The new Perfect Eyes line from Essica makes putting on eye makeup a breeze. 
Apply two perfectly blended colors in one swipe. Prevent slips with the Easy Line Hand Steadying Eyeliner. Perfect eyes at your fingertips. This team built on the order of 70 to 80 prototypes. They built almost all of them in shape deposition technology, kind of pre-manufacturing prototypes, because you can't get a user opinion about this stuff with foam core and tape and paper. You gotta have a real look and feel and behave like the real thing. They went on to produce a whole system that's being adopted by the company. The solution is this little, uh, to the eyeliner, is this little thing which is uh, like a ring goes on your finger and a little brush, yeah? Didn't invent the brush. But they invented or they discovered a magical thing. Most eye makeup, you have a brush and you connect it to the end of this half meter, well, meter long arm robot and it tries to draw this little precise line and it's tough. Solution. Plant your thumb on your cheekbone and use your little finger four to five centimeters of robot. Very precise. Counterpoint to the eye maker. Who is the user? The satellite is about three meters in diameter, about uh, five meters high. It's huge. It has 350 to 450 electronic modules, all of which have to be interconnected and serviced with power, serviced with thermal. It's a nightmare world of technicians validating the satellite. So every oval there is yet another technician. Here it's a little easier to see that most of the time they're operating in clean suits. So it's a miserable work environment. And we discovered that Kevin is the critical user, the test engineer. Not the architect, not the rocket science guy, not the communication technology guy. These guys, all those technicians, cost more than the satellite. Help. Make it easy to do the job. Make it lie down flat. Now we can get a job done. The problem is, it's never, it's impossible to unfold a satellite. Everybody we talked to told us, impossible. We don't see in those images, and I regret I just don't have the picture, is that while all you saw there was CAD, that's the big picture, but the little picture was that joint, which can't be done. It can't be done because there are cables as big as my leg going across that joint, and because the heat pipes have to go across the joint, and there's never been a flexible heat pipe. 
So they had to build a full-scale, real, functional hinge point that transported the cables and got the heat pipe across flexibly, and they did that. I need to stop these examples, but this one's quick, and since you're a car lover community, to be brisk to the part that I sometimes like the most. This is the group of people who study what the practitioners do. So in my world practice, in the world best practice, I like to translate that to best dogma. Because best practice is almost always based on what we did last year. Therefore, we'll do it again. And we'd like to get beyond that to understand the fundamentals of design teams. Video interaction analysis, we're typically recording the video and audio of a team at work. We analyze it in depth. One of our earliest findings by John Tong was that gesture is the primary channel for mediating interaction in the team which was a big surprise. Nobody was studying gesture at that point, let alone gesture as mediated. He's now the head of interaction design at Microsoft. I think we have, yeah. Next one, going quickly. So what do technical people do with information when they're working together to design something? And this graph summarizes Four, six kinds of information usage, two to retrieve, two to work with, three to store again, two to store again. And the big deal is the median duration, seven seconds. That's how long technical people spend attending to any one factor. And they move on. You are paying attention to me for, on average, seven seconds and you're gone. We don't know when you'll come back. If I do something outrageous, you might come back sooner. What was that? If your teammates don't come back, if they don't seem to be paying attention, they aren't, huh? with good reason. There's all this other storming going on. Uh, we found that that seven-second rule had been found in six different disciplines to come back to the, it's a fundamental human time constant, cognition time constant. Here we're looking at the reports that are written after five, 15, and 25 weeks. We're looking at the language that's used, and we're discovering that some teams at the left end of the blue line haven't been creating a lot of unique noun phrases. A noun phrase is just a noun plus any modifier. So it's a screen width, screen height, line thickness, line color. 
and they have a, add more unique noun phrases. Those are the guys that deliver the thank you. Some other teams start higher, add noun phrases at a higher rate. That's a definition of learning. And they produce the wow. So this is one of the first times we got this big correlation between learning and wow. We were really looking for questions because we've long felt that design is a question-driven process, not a decision-driven process. And so we have a graph here of the questions asked per hour, about 40. Those are the wow teams. Questions asked at the 20 per hour, thank you teams. What kinds of questions? GDQ is a generative design question. It's how many ways could we do? How many ways could we approach? How many things could I say next? Convergently, what will I say next? Convergently, given the circumstances, what's best? Convergently, why be I be I be? In that seven seconds, I can compute anything and output anything. So a cycle of design for me is about 14 seconds. Inhale, exhale. That's what we do, guys, all day long. We talk a lot, we do a lot, it's based on that. Ten, go faster, he said. Now, it's back to teams and how they communicate with a focus on divergent and convergent behavior. So Mark Shar took the six most divergent people in my class, put them on a team. Don't do that. He took the six most convergent people, put them on another team. Don't do that. Now give them a challenge to pick the best shoe given the facts. The facts are written on sheets of paper. Each person gets a sheet. <clears throat> Here's what they do. If they read all the sheets of paper, which they don't, they pick that shoe. 95% confidence. That was tested. Let's watch them share facts in green, share questions in blue. These are the divergent. They started up. Promptly, they share facts and questions pretty evenly. That's the way they work. Let's watch the convergent. Just go with the flow of this. Don't try to read it too closely. Because we've all been in meetings that had these properties. I'll play it once together, so again, so you can feel the difference in the dynamics between these two groups. They are distinctively different, and there's some quantitative measures we can make. But it was so compelling we had to do another experiment, Mark did. Now, which is the best bottle for the next fragrance from Neutrogena? The divergent, sharing commonly held information and pink, orange, uniquely held. Sheet of paper, everybody's got the blue, only one person's got the orange. They reject a choice, they make a selection, it's the winner. They got the right one. Let's watch the convergent. A decision, nothing shared. What happens next is called rationalization. They actually picked the worst such. After the more information came out, they start rationalizing. Things like, well, yes, we picked the most expensive bottle, but it's so good the customer will pay for it. <coughs> Okay, big effects. We're really getting into team dynamics. 
Take a little different direction. You've heard me push tangible. If you want to design a process, stop talking about it and start building a tangible version. This was a clinic, a service scenario. You want to redesign the clinical process. They have a scenario consultant, Marcus Gwinnett, 5,000 euro a day. He's going to write words on the board by interviewing people in the clinic. Midday, our guys show up with a bunch of plastic blocks on which you write functions of the clinic. And all of the clinic team is there. The physicians, the consultant, the Putzfrau, everybody's there. And they make this model. And the end of the first day, they all agree it represents what they want. It covers a lot of tables. It's a big, hairy thing. Overnight, the CS guy in the group translates what's on the table into a CAD model. Yesterday, everybody could manipulate the model. Today, only the guy with the mouse and keyboard can manipulate the model. They spend the day coming to agree that the CAD model and the table model are equivalent. And at the end of, midway through that third day, they're done. They're all happy. It's good. They saved half the consulting fee, and Marcus went home hungry. Not very hungry. But that's about how to communicate. Now we want to look at another dimension of communication that we've been, let's say, suspicious about for a long time, but we're not brave enough to look at. And that's how emotions are affecting technical team performance. I think you're not surprised by the one on the left, but maybe you're surprised by the one on the right. Car sales as a deal between liars. And I've come to generalize that, to think that an awful lot of what we do in the world is essentially negotiation between liars, intended or not. There's some more pieces. I don't speak to them. We're now making a decision model, a math model, from the point of view of the manager. He wants profit. How does he get profit? He's got a model. There's a probability density function associated with each line. Nothing about the customer experience. So our researcher added some elements to the decision model having to do with the experience. And he focused his attention on this pathway from the initial phone call to a visit and the probability of a sale. We already know the probability of a sale if you visit. All phone calls to American car dealers are recorded. The result. The vertical axis is the salesperson expressing negative emotions. And the number one word to note is contempt. We are really good as pe people are really good at contempt. And there are many, many facial expressions and postures that deal with it. And the horizontal is the salesperson expresses something positive. The manager says this is the critical break point for a sale. He makes it up out of his experience. Now we overlay the data points. Individual, customer, sales, episodes, and we add the sales. The green dots are sales. So overwhelmingly, if that conversation, the first three to four minutes, was positive, probability of a sale leaps. If it's negative, chances go down, and there are outliers. It's really a complex system. 
We can't predict anything, everything from any one variable. And this is the model. I just flipped through it to kind of maybe convince the audience that it's quantitative, it's analytic, probabilistic, and we find out what the sales will be. But let's now look at the money made per month. So if 60% of those calls manage to be positive, we're going to earn about 220000 a month in that case. If we bump the probability of good by 10%, we make more. If we, bad button again, if we do less well and lower the probability, we do a lot worse. So this is not a linear curve, this is a steep curve. This is wonderful for us because it's one of the few times we've actually connected design performance, user experience to profit. And this is where I'll pause because I think I don't have more time. What do you think? One more example? One more example. Edelman is looking at how the prototypes we use in an in the discussion, influence the quality of design work. And he's been developing this set of ideas for quite a while, and he goes to the final experiment. The final experiment is he gives 10 groups a laboratory design challenge, and then he ranks their performance, concept change, what was the breadth of their ideation and relevance, the vertical axis, where the idea is relevant. And then he takes the group 10, the highest performing group, and group 2, the lowest performing group, and he does a very careful frame-by-frame -frame video analysis of what they do. can all feel the difference, yes? Did you imagine that if you show the next design team those two video clips, or the equivalent, that you can get that next design team to choose how to behave? And if they want big ideas, they know they're going to have to move around and gesture and think. And if they don't want to do that, they can it's learnable and teachable, and here's the difference. The blue team is the breakaway guys. The red team is the... Uh, thank you, guys. Surface and usability, the columns in the middle. Well, we all do that. Sure, we do the form and the form function and usability, and they're about the same. But as we move away from the problem as given to us, the use scenario, and the system level thinking, the blue guys are way out there. They're redefining the borders of the problem. And if we look the other way, how deeply they go, it's the surface, the internal functions and behaviors, to the core 
critical essence of the product, the blue team is the only one there. And they're producing the breakthroughs, the other guys aren't, and believe it or not, when you show a team how to behave, it can actually do it. In English, we have a phrase, monkey see, monkey do. You've got to have it in German, too. must sound a little different. And it is the most fundamental learning paradigm of us, the organism. Is that what you mean? Is that the behavior you wanted? I can do that. If you just tell me what to do, now it's a pause time. But I'll tell you what you're missing. This guy figured out how to code those team dynamics in real time by producing. I could create language. something that keeps them like Five together. Yes, yeah, so that keeps in like during time. a car trip. Don't go they wouldn't get them. bored. Just tell you. Then they could do He's using improvisational theater as a model. And he's using much of the principles, coding them and transforming them into technical design work. And we now have shorthand, an instrument that could be used in real time to help a team manage its own activity. And I can't do Greg for you, but I'll give you Greg's big result. The number one variable correlating with positive team performance across 50 global international teams was the team's ability to deliver that behavior. Empathy having some feeling for other people, action, trying to be helpful. No other of the 17 variables consistently correlated with height and performance. This is an extraordinary outcome in part because it now explains one of our favorite dogmas. We push empathy all the time but we didn't have research that supported that idea, and now we do, big time. 